Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly chess interview show where we talk with accomplished chess players, authors, and personalities about their lives, their careers, and how to improve at chess. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters and by Chessable.com. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. Chess Books recaptured a monthly recap of an often classic chess book. This, this month's edition is no exception. We are going to be talking about The Seven Deadly Chess Sins by Grandmaster Jonathan Rousen, a book I've long been a fan of, as regular listeners may have heard, and our guest co-host has also long been a fan of. In fact, uh, when I launched this um, this project, he emailed me very quickly and planted his flag on one of the Rousen books. So we've been waiting for a good time to do it, and now it is time. So let's bring in our guest co-host. He is, by day, a law professor, um, by night, uh, plays a lot of chess. He is a bit of a speed chess specialist, a USCF expert, um, lives in Chicago. So he's friendly with some people you may have heard on the podcast, such as uh, legendary park player Tom Murphy and uh, accomplished adult improver JJ Lang, who, of course, has moved on to Nebraska. Um, and now we would like to bring him in and discuss this excellent book. So, David Franklin, how are you, sir? I'm good. It's good to be with you. Yeah, exciting stuff. We're both big fans of this book, although I have to be honest, David, I hadn't read it for like 20 years um, until, which is <laughs> that's alarming. Just that sentence is alarming. Um, uh, but I hadn't read it for a long time until digging into this project. Could you tell us a bit about your history with this book and why you were eager to discuss it? Yeah, sure. No, I hadn't read it for a while either, but I guess like the priests and rabbis say, it's, you know, it's good to revisit your sins, you know, every 20 years or so, if not more frequently than that. Um, but yeah, this is a, this is a book that, that I've uh, been a fan of for, uh, for a long time. Um, I, I think it's what we're going to get into kind of what is distinctive about this book, but, you know, it really resonated for me. Um, I think of, you know, because of, kind of the kind of player that I am. Um, I'm kind of a chess addict. I, I read about the game a lot. I, I, I watch games online. I play a lot of blitz. Um, and I think, you know, without being immodest, I think my chess understanding, um, you know, is, is, is pretty high, but my chess results like have never been uh, as high as my understanding. So I've been a USCF expert, uh, for almost 20 years, most of that time, well above 2100, but I've never made a uh, master. Um, and I think that what's held me back are sort of not strictly chess related factors so much. I mean, certainly my chess could use a lot of improvement too, but really the problem for me are sort of psychological, emotional factors like impatience or boredom or, or, or lack of focus, loss of objectivity, loss of nerve, all of those sort of not strictly chess related factors. And the thing about Rousen's book, as we're going to get into, is that it really speaks to those kind of deeper psychological and emotional factors as much as it speaks to strictly chess issues. So like right at the beginning, there's a quote where Rousen says, whatever your strength as a player, it's the way in which you harness your thoughts and your emotions that matters. Um, and that really spoke to me and it continues to speak to me. Yeah, I, I, the book resonated with me in a similar way, even though I feel like chess wise, maybe we're coming at it from a different um, angle, because I always feel like if anything, I overachieved over the board as opposed to like, as compared to my broader chess ability, I think I was good at the competitive aspect of chess. Um, and maybe like, was able to punch above my weight uh, based on that, as opposed to like, if you did like a tactics contest with somewhat of my rating or something like that. But despite that us sort of coming from opposite angles, I think the game, the book resonated with me in a similar way because I still like the philosophical side of chess, the historical side of chess. And this book um, and the, his describing of the flaws that the, the quote unquote seven deadly sins that we'll be discussing, obviously a couple of them resonated with me and a couple of them I think would resonate with anyone. I mean, it would be different for each person, but certainly um, there, there are going to be sections of the book 
that that will speak to many people. Now, David, you and I have both discussed that this book, we we are big fans of this book. It's it is considered kind of a modern classic. Um, it came out in the year 2000, um, but it's a bit polarizing. Um, so why do you think it is that not everyone shares our love for this, for the seven deadly chess sins? Yeah. I mean, this book is definitely not for everyone. I mean, Rousen is an incredibly smart and well-educated guy. I mean, he's a guy who like took a first class degree at Oxford, um, has a PhD, you know, he's founded institutions that are devoted to thinking about sort of how we think and how that relates to public policy issues like climate change. I mean, the guy is really deep and mindful and soulful and smart. And the book sort of reflects that, right? It's, it's, it's digressive and erudite and kind of pretentious at times and playful at other times. And, and it's, it's just anything but straightforward. You know, sometimes Rousen seems to speak in, in, in riddles you know, or, or you're not quite sure what the point is. Sometimes he even says that he's not sure what the point is uh, of some of his digressions and some of his discussions. Like, for example, right at the beginning of the book, there's a, there's a fragment of a game that he says he dreamed he was playing against Kasparov, right? And it's fascinating, but I've read that section like three times and I still can't figure out what the point of it is other than right. kind of cool that he dreamed, you know, a game fragment where he was playing against Kasparov. So I think that, you know, the book is is going to sort of bewilder or infuriate um, some readers who are looking for something more straightforward. Whereas if I, I think if you're willing to be like introspective about your chess and you're willing to sort of go along for the ride and and let yourself be provoked and sort of stimulated by what Rousen is doing, um, then you're going to be like us and you're going to really love the book. Yeah, and I love the book, and but I was struck as I was, um, as I mentioned to you offline, rereading it for the first time in twenty years. Like the, the the first part of the book in particular is quite meandering, and the first two positions are one from the the dreamed game against Kasparov, and the other like the the starting position of chess, where he like you know puts it up in the book, exposes a diagram, and says consider this position, you know? So that, that's sort of, that's gonna, some people are gonna be like, okay, I'm in for something different and that's not a bad thing, but other people are gonna be kind of rolling their eyes right from the beginning when that's how the game begins. And then only uh, in what would be the paper version, I re, I, I've had, this is the third time I bought this book. You're welcome, Grandmaster Rousen. Um, so I've had two different paper versions. And for this, I read the Kindle, which it's inexpensive on Kindle. So even if you're just mildly curious, it's uh, well worth getting. But I believe in the paper version, it's like 30 pages before he really dives into the book, um, which definitely sets sets the overall tone for why some people don't like the book and why others do. So you talked a little bit more, a little bit about uh, Grandmaster Rousen's background. One thing, of course, I wanted to plug is that um, he was on the podcast episode 150 when his book, uh, I believe it was last year, came out, uh, The Moose That Matter. Um, and it's that's a different book in its own right. We should probably discuss his other books a little bit too. So David, had you read his other books when you read the seven, I mean, his preceding books? Well, it's really only one book when you read. Yeah, the, so he had one chess. book before this one, um, which he wrote when I think he was still barely out of his teen years, um, called "Understanding the Grunfeld," um, which you know, I mean, it's that book is more than twenty years old now, and the Grunfeld is such a dynamic opening. So I'm sure all the variations have been superseded, but it's actually still a really interesting and fun and helpful book in thinking about. The, the ideas behind uh, the Grunfeld defense. So I definitely had read that because I actually used to torture myself by playing the Grunfeld. And that was one of the books that I used as my guide. Um, and then this one was published when he, when Rousen was just 23 years old, which is kind of amazing when you think about how much sort of deep and interesting stuff there is in here. He then uh, published a book about five years later called Chess for Zebras, uh, which I did read. I actually read that in manuscript because I was taking some lessons from Rousen at the time, and he was kind enough to share the draft of the book with me, and I gave him a, a few thoughts on it that I'm sure were not very helpful at all. Um, I have not read uh, The Moves That Matter, which just, as you said, came out like 2019 or something. So he's he's written four chess books, and he's written a bunch of other stuff about you know, spirituality, climate change, you know, all kinds of stuff. I mean, he's a real public intellectual. 
Yeah, and the moves that matter is in that vein. It's not a chess book. It's a book that tries to contextualize chess in his life and, and other people's lives. And uh, for anyone who hasn't heard my interview with him, that, that'll give you a good sense for, for whether you would like that book or not. I did like it, and I actually did notice some sort of through lines um, f all the way back from from this book in two thousand, published in two thousand, to the moves that matter, such as the the intrinsic value of concentrating in chess, which he still fleshed out as a theme in the moves that matter. But anyway, as you say, I mean, it's uh, amazing that he wrote this book when he was just uh, twenty three, because whatever one thinks of it, um, it's a it's a precocious work, um, and it's you know it's been rec it's been recommended many times on the podcast, um, it, you know. People who like it love it. Recent guest of the show, I am Andres Toth, actually uh, listed it as one of his favorites um, just off the, off the top of my head. Um, I am John Watson, wrote a very favorable review of it when it came out in uh, The Week in Chess, Mark Crowther's The Week in Chess. He said it's a, an extraordinarily original book that tackles the broad issue of practical chess psychology. This is clearly a labor of love, sometimes disorganized, but remarkably comprehensive in its look at the psychological reasons for failure at chess. Um, and th there were many other reviews, most of them positive um, when it came out. So how did it, do you remember how it crossed your radar, David, since? I, I don't, I think I had had the Grunfeld book and then, you know, the title of this book probably jumped out at me, right? Because it's sort of, you know, it's got a great premise, right? These seven failings or shortcomings that chess players are, are prone to. Um, and so I'm sure I was attracted to that, but I know that I had already read the book by the time I met, uh, Rousen, um, because that was more like 2003, I think. And the book, came, you know, had come out a couple of years earlier and I think I got it when it came out. Okay. Yeah. And it's, it's a pretty original book. You and I were talking about whether we could think of any similar chess books uh, at the time that it came out in 2000, books that might have been like the sort of uh, intellectual ancestors of it. And we struggled to come up with many. So I went to the uh, Facebook chess book collectors group, shout out to everyone who contributed to that conversation, and just kind of tried to crowdsource. Um, and the consensus, I think, was the one book that got mentioned the most. And of course, he's being as you've mentioned he's an academic so he sources things very diligently there's a nice bibliography at the end uh so it's kind of easy to see what his references were and one book that came up chess wise more than any other was the chess mind by gerald abrahams apparently written in 1951 it's quoted right at the beginning of the the book where he says uh, uh in chess one realizes that all education is ultimately self-knowledge um he also quotes uh, John Nunn's Secrets of Practical Chess a lot, John Tisdall's Improve Your Chess Now, um, which of course was repack, recapped on this podcast a couple months back, uh, Genius in Chess by GM Jonathan Levitt, and a few other books, but a uh, friend of the show and long time ago guest of the show, Alex King, pointed out that um, it, one of the main uh, influences he believes was uh, this book, Godel, Escher, and Bach by, by Hofstetter. Um, he talks about the book Emotional Intelligence by Daniel Goleman. His former teacher, Richard James, very well-known scholastic teacher in uh, Great Britain, who's written um, written a couple great books himself, mentioned his enthusiasm for Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, a kind of um, uh, you know classic uh, philosophical book outside of chess. So for for listeners familiar with any of those, that that should give you a sense of uh, of of where this where this book is coming from. Yeah, it's it's clear that Rousen, you know, even at that young age, was reading widely, and he sort of wears his learning on his sleeve for sure. Um, you know, there's a, there's a book that I, I bet it's it, it, it's very obscure um, uh, chess book. I don't even think I've heard it mentioned on your podcast, but there's some things about it that remind me a little bit of this one. There's a book called. Dynamics of Chess Strategy by the Czech Grandmaster Vlastimil Jansa, um, which is this, I don't even think it's in print anymore, um, but there are these um, uh, philosophical references in it. There's, there's a lot of quotations of classic philosophers like Cicero and Seneca. Jansa is clearly a, a guy who, who likes to think philosophically as well. A lot of that book is actually about his training of a young and promising Czech 
a chess player named David Navarra, who of course oh, is you know, a super grandmaster. So I um, mean, a very different book, but a kind of a similar philosophical feel. Yeah, and and we'll get into the what the seven sins, sins are in a moment. Just a couple other sort of um, guideposts to to give listeners to the podcast um, in terms of what rating this book is uh is best for i would say it's a pretty advanced book i know i've made the mistake of recommending it to some students who who then read it i mean and these are adult students who then check it out and they're like uh yeah that that wasn't really for me um i so i would say probably at least 1800 at least in terms of the chess analysis the chess analysis is quite advanced but the psychological and philosophical underpinnings are something that are going to resonate. They can resonate with anyone. It's just if your your goal is to maximize your chess improvement, I think even Chess for Zebras, his follow up, is a better choice amongst many other books that are recommended. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't read this. Uh, what do you yeah, think? Yeah, I think that's probably right. I mean, the the Chess for Zebras book is a lot like this one. the The main difference, though, I think, is that. In that book, he spends a lot of time talking about his interactions with his students, many of whom are below 1800 strength. And so there's a little bit of the sort of Jeremy Silman amateur's mind feeling at parts in parts of the Chess for Zebras book, uh, whereas this book is pretty much just about high level chess. And it, it, again, as I was saying earlier, it's like if your chess is pretty advanced but you've got sort of these psychological, emotional sort of issues that are standing in the way of achieving your sort of full potential, this book is for you. So yeah, I think you're right. right? 1800 or, or 1900 and above is probably the right place to be. Yeah, at least in terms of like playing through the games and stuff like that. And Chess for Zebras, I just took a quick look at it. I haven't revisited it. It'll probably be its own podcast recap at some point. Um, but he says in that that the driving thesis of it is that that chess improvement begins at the edge of your comfort zone. So I know that that's sort of like a common theme that comes up in the the interviews that I do here. So um, listeners who want something um, slightly um, l more practical might want to check that out. The other sort of um, just note of warning that I wanted to give any listeners. Again, I do recommend the book. But one thing that struck me in rereading this book in the middle of the pandemic with everyone stuck at home, myself included, pretty far removed from OTB chess at the moment, even though I'm planning to play when it's possible again. This book is very, very over the board tournament oriented. It's very much about sort of the hand to hand combat of, of chess tournaments playing against another person, the psychological struggle. So I think anyone from either a newer generation or a generation where they just haven't gotten around to getting back to a tournament, if you're just looking for general chess how-to, like so much of it is about the psychological str struggle that I don't often feel doing online chess. Um, what about you as a blitz specialist, David? What do you think? I guess that's right. I mean, there aren't that many books that are sort of focused on something other than tournament players. I mean, that's sort of the the baseline for most books. Um, but I, I can see what you're saying. I mean, I guess to the extent that, uh, you know, online chess or rapid chess is a little bit less about that psychological crucible, you know, then maybe this book um, would be slightly less apropos. Um, but I still think it's hugely valuable. I mean, it you know, there are certainly things... Um, in this book that we'll, we'll get into in a minute that that have helped me as a blitz player. Um, uh, and I, I mean, I can talk about those when we get to them, but there are, there actually is a surprising amount of good old fashioned nuts and bolts chess improvement advice in this book. It's, it's sometimes hidden beneath a, a thick scrim of philosophy and musing and the like, but it's, it's there for sure. Okay, yeah, and we'll we, and we will get into the book in a moment. So the seven deadly sins, and um, you know this. By the way, this whole construct. I mean, it's it's a it's a lovely idea to have to frame it around the seven deadly chess sins. But I'm a little curious, like how much he had to sort of torture the sins in order to have it fit under that umbrella. Some of them are like perfect fits. A lot, a few of them there's there's kind of some overlap. But without further ado, the seven SIDs are thinking, blinking, wanting, materialism, egoism, perfectionism, and looseness. And for the rest of the podcast, we are going to break these SIDs down one by one. But first, we are going to take a break and hear from our sponsors. 
Perpetual Chess is happy to be brought to you in part by our longtime friends, but new sponsor, ChessMood.com. If you didn't catch episode 192 with their founder, GM Avtek Gregorian, you should listen to it to see what he's about. ChessMood is a subscription-based website with courses covering opening repertoires for white and black, covering middle game mastery, end game mastery, and more. They also have lots of free content, such as a ChessMood blog with written features by grandmasters about stuff like chasing the 3000 blitz rating and how to improve your chess and your mental game. Uh, They have on YouTube now daily lessons with the grandmaster that you can check out and subscribe for free. So there's lots to check out and I'll put all the links you need in the show notes. But the bottom line is go to chessmood.com and have a look around if you have not already. Okay, let's get back to the interview. And we are back and we are ready to discuss Sin number one, which I believe is the longest chapter in terms of his discussing the, the sin, it is thinking. And Grandmaster Rousen says he he concedes himself that this one is difficult to find. He said lucidity was hard to come by, but he says common symptoms of the thinking sin are confusion, pattern limitations, lack of faith in your intuition, and what he calls bureaucr- bureaucracy. Um, the best sort of um, the best sort of definition I could come up with, although more so than any of the other sins, even though this one came first, this was one I struggled to understand exactly what he meant. Um, but spinning your wheels, I would say, or perhaps overthinking. But how would you define it, David? Yeah, I mean, I think this is classic Rousen. You know, I, I think he is really attracted to paradox, and so he starts his book with a paradox, right? Which is that thinking can get you into trouble in this sort of most cerebral of games, right? Um, and that is hard to wrap your head around. It was hard for me too. It, it is quite, I think, bold of him to start his book with a chapter that's paradoxical and that's a little bit hard to understand. Um, but as you say, I think that the name of the sin is maybe a little bit misleading because the problem isn't thinking as such, right? It's it's sort of excessively analytical thinking. I think the, the theme for me of this chapter is that in addition to thinking, you also have to pay attention to the emotional environment of the game, right? So Rousen says, thoughts always have emotional content. They always have evaluative content. So you're not just thinking, what if I play this? Or what if he goes there? You're thinking, ooh, good, bad, scary, nervous, right? Um, and, And that isn't mere thinking. That's also feeling, right? And so I think for Rousen, rather than trying to banish the feeling side of things, we should embrace it, right? There's no point in pretending that your thoughts don't have emotional content because they always do. Um, Having said that, you know, I don't think that this particular sin, if I'm understanding it correctly, is one that I'm especially prone to. I, you know, I'm a blitz player as we've discussed, right? And so my problem is that my play is probably too intuitive. And my problem when I'm playing a slow tournament game is probably that I don't think analytically enough. I don't slow down and rigorously methodically analyze. Um, you know, I one, one parlor game that we can try to do with this book, if you're up for it, Ben, is sort of, as we go through, just think about like which of these sins we are personally most uh, liable to, right? I mean, you can, by the way, you can do this with the real seven deadly sins too, right? Envy, avarice, gluttony, sloth, lust, anger, pride. It's a fun parlor game to sort of think like, which of those am I most prone to? By the way, mine are are probably sloth and gluttony, but never mind. Right <laughs> for, for, for chess sins, um, thinking as he defines it, I'm not quite as worried about that. In fact, I think I could probably stand to do a little bit more analytical thinking. What about you? Does this sin resonate for you? It does. Yeah, I, I'm definitely prone, and especially in classical chess, again to sort of spinning my wheels. You know, sometimes I'll have these 15, 20 minute thinks where it's definitely. The, the think long, think wrong story where you're just kind of repeating things. You know, he mentions a uh, lack of faith and intuition. I'm definitely guilty of that. Um, so I, I believe that I'm guilty of, uh, of some of the sins that he describes, but I also feel like there's some overlap with the perfectionism um, that he discusses later um, that, that, we'll, that we'll discuss more um, as, as its own sin. So I'm not sure exactly where it fits in, but a sort of general indecision and having trouble committing to a plan, 
um, to the extent that that's what he means by thinking as opposed to the perfectionism one, whichever it is, I'm guilty of it. So yeah, yeah. But I think the, the coolest part of this chapter, though, in my view, is this discussion about talking to your pieces. Oh, is that in this chapter? Yeah. That's- yeah, that's actually in the thinking chapter. I'm not quite sure why it fits there, but right, who cares where it fits? It's it's just really cool, right? This is where Rousen just says like, you need to actually check in with your pieces as if they were, you know, animate, you know, participants in the game and, and sort of see if their if their needs are being met. I mean, preferably not out loud, because then you'll like truly li- be living out the stereotype of the crazy chess player. Huh. Um, um, but but in your head, right, you just sort of literally say and I, I actually sometimes do this, I think, as a result of reading this book. You know, like if if I push this pawn to f4 with white and it gets blockaded, then how's my bishop on c1 going to feel about that? My bishop's going to feel sort of claustrophobic and I'm going to feel guilty for having imprisoned it in that way, right? And if you're doing it right, if you're really talking to your pieces, um, it actually helps, I think. You sort of get this feeling that you're 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 making sure that everyone can contribute, you know, to the to the collective task. Um uh, do you ever talk to your pieces, Ben, or is it yeah, just no, that, crazy me? No, it's funny that you mentioned that because that, along with uh, something else, we'll get to the theory of infinite resistance. Those are the two concepts I've thought about the most subsequent to the book, even often citing the book as one that I like, but not having revisited it that much. Those are the two concepts that I think about just all the time. And just to flesh out the talking to your pieces a little bit more, it's a great sort of uh, construct of how to think positionally in chess. Um you know, they, they, you know, obviously they tell you when you're, you know, when you're telling something to kids, it's better to put it in a story. So this idea of sort of uh, personifying your pieces and thinking of them as characters in a story and making sure that they're all happy, especially in situations where you don't know what to do. Obviously, it's um, somewhat whimsical, but I also find, find it to be extremely helpful. So, yeah, big fan of the talking to your pieces uh, advice. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, Tom Murphy, who you've had on your podcast, likes to say, got to give everyone a job. (laughs) (laughs) Got to love Tom Murphy. Nice. Um, Cool. Well, let's bring it on to um, to sin number two, blinking. So he defines this as identifying or missing critical moments. What did you think of the, the blinking sin, David? Yeah, I think this one is such a, a common sin. Um, you know, the idea of like missing the critical moment, right? Failing to, to understand that the trend of the game has changed uh, and, and failing to adapt to that. I, I'm, I'm definitely guilty of this. I think most players are. You know, e- even Bobby Fischer, who's probably the most universal player in chess history, I think he sometimes had trouble with this. If you look at the uh, Soviet scouting reports on Fisher from the run up to the 1972 match with Spassky, um, which you can find in the book Russians versus Fisher. Um, several of the leading Soviet grandmasters say Fisher has this one weakness, which is that his playing style is really smooth, right? So he likes games where there's a consistent plan that is carried out consistently. And that if the position gets bumpy, you know, if there's a change in the trend, that sometimes he'll miss that. So if Fisher can miss it, right, then anybody can. I, I would say, you know, this is maybe the most common failing of, let's say, strong players. I think for weaker players, it's like they're still hanging pieces too often, right? But once you get past the I'm hanging my pieces phase, I think this issue of kind of losing the thread of the position, failing to adapt to changes in the trend, boy, that's probably the hardest thing to get good at. I'm not very good at it for sure. Yeah, and and this idea of there being a momentum in a chess game is something that, again, I feel like it's it's more pronounced in, in these slower struggles, but you really feel it when you're playing. I mean, you can you can walk up to a position, say you're checking in on a friend's game and it looks like they have a small advantage. But if you didn't see that 10 moves before they were totally winning, like, you, you know, you have no sense of the psychological torture that they're under at the moment. Or they might just be telling themselves a story about the game that bears no resemblance to to what you would think about it. So and and Rousen sort of another book that he quotes is another book that uh that, that we've done a book recap on uh, Alex Yermolinsky's classic, The Road to Chess Improvement. And he sort of builds on, on what GM Yermolinsky 
wrote about in the idea of, of trends in a game of sort of momentum shifts. And one of the earliest interviews I did in Perpetual Chess was uh, with uh, Grandmaster Yun Ludwig Hammer, who also mentioned that he mentioned uh, this book, I believe. Um, it was either this book or Yermo's book or both. But he said that the, the idea of there being trends in a game um, strongly resonated with him as well. So it goes the whole way up to the 2700 level. Yeah, and Rousen actually gives some some practical tips about how to recognize critical moments, uh, hopefully before they arrive, but 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 at least recognizing them sort of once they arrive, and things that you can do to try to regroup, um, to sort of adapt to the to the change. So there's actually a lot of practical wisdom in this book, and 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 really concrete tips in addition to um, the sort of ruminations that we've been uh, emphasizing. Yeah, I, I liked this chapter. The first chapter I was kind of so-so on, but but this one I I thought was really good. And and the idea just just I think he says somewhere like how important it is to play through whole games, you know, because you you just have to see the story. Um, and sometimes you know when you're doing tactics tra trainers or trying to illustrate a specific idea, I mean I don't think you should only play through whole games, but it definitely needs to be part of your study regimen. Just like to sort of uh, capture that feeling of needing to pick out the moment that's important and to feel the sort of the, the shifts of momentum that take place in, in a chess struggle. Um, so the third sin is wanting. Um, what's with wanting? <laughs> yeah, this one is, uh, is definitely evocative, right? I mean, I, the, the sin here, as I understand it, is, is all about being too attached to the result. Uh, of the game. And that can mean a number of different things, right? That could be like chalking up a win before you've actually achieved it, right? Or assuming that you're going to lose um, before you've actually lost or, or just playing to your expectations about the position as opposed to simply being in the moment. I know that sounds kind of corny, but it actually is really helpful to just be thinking about your game as a succession of moments where you're not attached to the end result, but you're in the flow. There's a lot of talk here about flow. Um, uh, and there's a lot more of it in Chess for Zebras, his next book, actually. right? I think we've all experienced that feeling, right? You're not worried about the result. You're not even worried about the evaluation. You're just playing to improve your position. You're looking for ideas. You're in the flow. And that's when things tend to go well, because you're not wanting some result. I, I actually think this is my personal worst sin of all. <laughs> you know, I just, I, I, I mean, I do feel flow when I play blitz, but man, when it comes to slow classical chess, I just, the burden of that result feels really heavy for me. It's so much harder for me to get into a flow state when I'm playing a slow tournament game. It's like asking someone to run a hundred meter dash in an hour, right? You can't run that slowly, <laughs> you know, and, and that's a weird metaphor I realize. but like, um, it, it's, it's when you, when you slow everything down that way, you start to think too much about the result. You, you, you lose that flow. And, um, and man, I, I, I actually really resonated with this when, when I first read it. Yeah, I, I'm guilty as well. And obviously, it's different for different people. Some people are intimidated when, especially when they play someone significantly higher rated than them. Some people might have the opposite problem where they take someone lightly when they play someone lower rated than them. Um, some people, it's kind of all of the above. But it's definitely a common affliction. I'm, I'm not immune to it. Um, Another, and the aforementioned theory of infinite resistance. So, I mean, one good thing is he prescribes this problem, but he also sort of gives some tips. Um, so he talks about, you know, positions where things things are, uh, you know, things look really bad, basically, and gives some practical advice for how not to just chalk it up or give up in, in bad situations. Um, so I'm going to... Yeah, one thing, Ben, that really stuck with me about that um, discussion was he, he talks about the sort of... Um, the goalkeeper's objective. Did you remember yeah, this yeah, part? Like, yeah. like, you know, so it's sort of like reorienting yourself so that if you feel like you're worse, right, then maybe you can just convince yourself that achieving a draw is like a win. I know it sounds incredibly simplistic, 
But that kind of reorientation can really be motivating. And so the, the, the relationship to goalkeeping is, you know, the, the goalkeeper is facing a penalty kick, right? 70% of those go in or something. I'm not a huge soccer fan, but it's, it's hard to block them, right? And so you define success as just keeping the other guy from scoring, right? It's not a, a goal that you've scored, but you can reorient yourself to thinking about it as a goal, right? And then it gives you a little bit more um, resistance, as you said. It gives you a little more motivation um, to hang on because you've got a new uh, definition of victory, which is holding the position rather than losing it. Yeah, it's great advice. I, I struggle with the false narratives. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, you, can't, you, you can't trick yourself? Yeah, I've never had much luck with that. But he he provides some great examples. I mean, he he shows a game where he was totally lost and he salvages a draw and he's basically like oozing pride. And and one thing that should be said about his writing generally is he's he's got no issues with like self-flagellation. I mean, his he shows he shows games that he draws from his own games. He draws from classic games. He draws from lesser known games. Um, and he's not showing off in any way. So I know some of the other sort of classic chess books, I've mentioned that a lot of the material is familiar, but that's not really an issue at all in this book. I mean, there's a lot of, you can really feel the struggle of, of all the games. And I did. Yeah, no, his, his games are not familiar. He does actually have a bunch of games in here that are ones that you've seen before, you know, there's some Kasparov Shirov games that are pretty famous. There's a, there's a Lasker Capablanca game. That's sort of the least interesting part of this book for me. I think a publisher nowadays wouldn't let an author use old familiar games like that, but all of Rousen's games, right. Are obviously brand new and he gives you the inside scoop on them. And it's fascinating. Yeah. Um, yeah, a few classics, but I've a couple of the books I've recapped recently um, have have even more. Like, I mean, partially because they were like simple chess. He was one of the first ones to to write about it, so it's a bit it's a bit unfair. But like uh, Yasser's right. winning chess strategies um, is a great book. But one of my knocks on it was I felt like I'd seen a lot of the games before. Um, this one, it's not as big an issue despite the few classics. Um, so I did want to read the block quote of uh, the theory of infinite resistance just because this part uh, resonated with me so much and, yeah. I, and I think about it so often. So he says, well, well, we start from a simple premise. A lost position is not a hopeless position. To retain your inner composure in a lost position, you need to forget the idea of losing and focus on the hope. The crux of the solution is given by, quote, the theory of infinite resistance, originally devised by an Australian player called Bill Jordan. GM Ian Rogers describes it thus. It is a theory designed to encourage players to fully utilize the defensive resources available in a bad or even strategically lost position. It postulates that when a player makes a serious mistake or reaches a bad position, if he or she continues to try to find the best possible moves thereafter, he or she can put up virtually infinite resistance and should not lose. Of course, some positions are beyond even perfect defense, but their number is far smaller than imagined. If you examine your game, your own games closer, you may see some evidence for this theory. It is not at all easy to win one positions if your opponent does not cooperate. Thus, if you can find the will, your last line of defense can be made extremely difficult to break down. However, finding this willpower is in some ways the most difficult aspect of the theory, especially in passive positions, which seem to offer only the tiniest chance of a draw and no chances of victory. My aim is to encourage you to feel gumptious even in these situations. And the following is a compendium of things to do to keep your spirits up in lost positions. And then he gives a, a bunch of tips. Um, the, pr the prominent one being one that's also talked about in uh, David Smerenin's new book on swindling, which is find something you like about your position. Um, yeah. Which yeah, no, that's a great quote. I, I, I love that word gumptious. That's yeah. one of his favorite words. In fact, that was his ICC handle. Oh, really? Day. That's right. Was, uh, was gumptious. Um, you know, it just means sort of being being filled with a kind of positive energy, right? And, and, and grit, yeah. right? Um, and, and yeah, I mean that, that quote I think is even more apt like nowadays because computers have, have taught us, right. That there's so many more defensive resources in positions than we had previously understood, at least at the high level. So that can also give you a kind of a, a sense of like, this position is actually holdable, right. You know, just have to hang on. Um, yeah, this chapter about on wanting actually was really, um, 
quite meaningful for me as well. I, I think I learned something from this chapter that um, maybe helped me more than any of the other chapters. And that is um, to basically never make draw offers. So, so like at the time that I read this book, you know, 20 years ago, I, I was making draw offers in games. And then if my opponent declined uh, the offer, I would always play terribly afterwards and then I would lose, right? And, and, the, and what I realized from reading this book was because I, I was offering these draws and, and, and I wanted that result too much, right? The, the, the thing with me is like the stress of a, of a classical tournament game was sometimes unbearable. Just the idea of being locked in this hours long struggle across from someone you can't even talk to them about it, right? You know, during the game. And so I would offer draws in slightly worse positions, maybe even slightly better positions. And I would just be like hoping that my opponent would accept my offer because it would just end the misery of the game. <laughs> I, the, the lesson from this was probably I just shouldn't be playing tournaments at all because right? right. it was so unpleasant. But but I was offering draws. And it, what, what I realized is like you're, you're placing your fate in the hands of someone else, right? They can either give you this thing that you desperately want, right? The draw, or they can withhold it, right? And then when they withheld it, I would become dejected and I would find... I would find it really hard to refocus. And, and so I'd play poorly. And so, you know, as a result of sort of reading this book and thinking more about this wanting sin, I realized that the only solution for me, other than quitting tournament chess altogether, right, um, was just to never offer draws. And, and so I basically have never offered a draw for hmm. almost 20 years. And it served me well. Huh, do you I'm, offer draws, Ben? Yeah, I do. I mean, I haven't had quite the, the degree of issues that you have, but I've had a few like timely draw offers from my opponent throw me off. Like uh shout out to, to Jerry Wheeler, who there's like a 5% chance he'll listen to this. Um, but, <laughs> but I played him in one world open in the, the late nineties and I was like a tiny bit better in a position and he was more experienced than maybe like 50 points higher rated than me. Um, but he offered a draw at this moment where I had a slight advantage and I basically just self-destructed in like 10 moves and lost. Um, oh man, so, that's the flip side of yeah, my issue. Yeah, so I, I've, but, the, but, but that stuck with me. I, I, I try to be very conscious of that like going forward. So that, that was a good lesson to learn. But, um, but yeah, so I mean, everyone is affected differently by the afflictions he describes, but he definitely uh, hits the nail on the head very often. Um, which brings us to our next sin, which is called materialism. But before we dig into materialism, we're gonna take another break and hear from our sponsors again. Two things to make sure you're aware of this week from Chessable. Number one, rumor has it that the seven deadly chess sins will actually be coming to Chessable later this year. So if you've never pulled the trigger on this book, I wouldn't be mad at you if you waited until that came out and checked it out on Chessable using their Move Trainer technology. Number two, just in case you didn't hear the news yet, Chessable now has an app available on iOS that makes reviewing and learning chess openings easier than ever. Okay, back to the book recap. So the fourth chapter is another favorite of mine. This one is called Materialism, um, probably more self-explanatory than some of the um, some of the other chapters. Um, so he describes it as a lack of dynamism or oversights, but obviously the sort of the main theme is um, is is being too attached to the point values that we're taught. A common theme from the podcast that a lot of non grandmasters struggle with, such as myself. Um, what did you think of this chapter, David? I love this chapter. This chapter is so funny and poetic. You know, I mean, he actually reflects on the distinctive personality of each chess piece. You know, it's not kind of a, a dry data driven thing. Um, you know, it's not like like Larry Kaufman has done some really interesting stuff about the value of the pieces, right? And 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 so forth. And and that's not quite what Rousen is doing. He he's really kind of again, he's now he's he's talked to his pieces. We know that, right? So he's learned a little bit about their personality, I guess, from from talking to them. And my my absolute favorite part of this chapter, and probably my favorite part of the book, is his discussion of the two bishops. 
um, because he sort of treats the two bishops as if they're a piece almost in their own right when they're together. Um, and I, I just thought that was super memorable and actually really helpful. Um, but in this discussion, I mean, Rousen references actually one of my favorite works of art, which is the uh, the, the symposium, Plato's symposium, uh, you know, which is basically this drunken dinner party where Plato invites like all of the greatest philosophers and artists of ancient Athens to this dinner party. And they're kind of all giving their definitions of love. Now, you may wonder what on earth this has to do with chess or bishops, but I'm, I'm getting there. I'm getting there, right? So one of the participants in this dinner party is Aristophanes, the, the comic playwright. And he tells this story, right, which is that men and women used to be fused together as part of the same organism. But then many, many eons ago, they were split apart by the gods or something, right? And then love is each person's way of searching for and trying to reunite with uh, that person that they were literally separated from, which is really interesting. It doesn't really account for same-sex love, but we'll overlook that for now. Um, and so what what on earth does this have to do with, with chess? Well, Rousen says that like we can think of the two bishops as if they used to be a single piece, right? A piece that can cover all of the squares on the board, right? Both color complexes. So that when you have the bishop pair and your opponent doesn't, it's like you have this distinctive piece, which Rousen memorably calls the hermaphrodite, <laughs> right? Um, and, you know, if your opponent only has one bishop or none, then your opponent is like, you know, lost and looking for love. And you're like, you're in love and you're good, right? Um, and I just love that. I love thinking of the two bishops as a kind of a piece in their own right. I actually think that this part of this chapter, as weird as it seems, actually helped me appreciate uh, the power of the bishop pair. Um, and incidentally, it, it reminded me of that famous quote from Spassky about his first wife uh, from whom he was divorced. Oh, right, yeah. When he said, you know, we were we were bishops of opposite colors. Mm -hmm. So I guess, you know, the... The, the two the two bishops can be united in love or they can be split apart again and then they're they're lonely and they're on their own colors once again but I just I just love that whole discussion yeah it's good stuff I actually it 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 didn't leave a mark the first time I read it but uh, it, but I was really struck by by how how convincing he was about like how important the, the bishop pair is um, and just generally, he gives lots of great examples of uh, sort of, you know, positional sacrifices or, you know, classic examples of um, strong players understanding that dynamism can be more important than the point values and sort of talking about sort of the extreme double-edged sword of uh, being taught chess with these point values stuck in our head. And then as you get more advanced, trying to have to unlearn that and references teaching and like a talented, I believe it was around a 2000 level student of his at the time that he was really having tr trouble teaching um, to, to value the pieces differently based on context. And one quote that really resonated with me in the, in the advice he gave is uh, he said, the key is to see pieces, not as blocks of wood, but as bundles of energy. Um, Totally. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. There's also this hilarious quote where he's talking about rooks, which are, let's face it, Ben, the most boring piece mm -hmm. on the board. I mean, that's, that's clearly the case, right? Um, it's no wonder that rook endings are, are kind of dull. But anyway, I, I, I digress. Obviously, if I were a better chess player, I would appreciate the richness and beauty of rook endings. But, but he says, uh, he compares the rook to the queen, right? Because the queen is basically a rook plus a bishop, right? And he says that in his view, the, the rook has bishop envy. <laughs> the rook looks at the queen and says, oh, the queen has a bishop. So I, I love that sort of uh, uh, rather off-color reference there. But I just thought that was hilarious. Yeah, definitely talking to his pieces uh, not <laughs> all the time. <laughs> Maybe a little too much. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, I don't have much more to say about that chapter, but but I agree with you, David. It's definitely one of my favorites and, um, you know, up there in the pantheon of uh, – of great uh, instructional material for for anyone who's struggling to to um, break from the chains of uh, just thinking of uh, the pieces as having static values. Yeah, he has this one other really lovely quote, which is something like, "The knights bring a curvy energy to what would otherwise be a rectilinear game." Yeah, <laughs> um, and that is so true. That's why the knights are like the most difficult piece to master because they hop back and forth to different color complexes and they do they sort of interrupt the uh 
the strict kind of angular logic uh, uh, of chess by bringing this this curvilinear quality to it. I love that. Yeah, yeah. There's there's lots of good stuff in there. Um, so sin number five is another one where I feel like um, I couldn't. It, it wasn't as distinct to me as something like the materialism sin. Uh, and sin number five is egoism, forgetting the opponent, um, fear, and thinking about um, how many results I am playing for. He he describes as sort of some of the uh, the hallmarks of the those who suffer from the the egoism sin. Um, what did you think of this chapter, David? Yeah, I think this is actually an issue that Rousen is probably just really interested in in general in life. It's something he calls intersubjectivity, okay, which means basically that chess is not just your game, right? It's you and an opponent who you're together, you're creating something. It's an intersubjective enterprise. I, I think Rousen thinks about politics that way. I think he thinks about family that way. Um, you know, I think he wants to make people experience the threat of climate change intersubjectively, which is kind of vague and hard to get your head around. You sometimes feel like I'm not smart enough to quite follow Rousen where he's going here. But with respect to chess, I do think it's a lot of it is is quite straightforward, actually. It's it's you 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 tend to forget that you have an opponent, right? So for example, if you're feeling nervous at the board. He says, don't forget, you're probably not the only one who's nervous, right? Your opponent probably is too. Um, and so this sin of egoism, I think it encompasses a whole bunch of things like self-doubt, being intimidated, but also being overconfident, um, you know, uh, and, and so becoming aware of your opponent's subjectivity um, is actually a really interesting way of thinking about how to come to grips with some of those feelings over the board. Uh, I, I definitely found this chapter elusive. It was it was it was not always obvious what the practical takeaway from it was. Um, but I also thought it was really provocative, really thought provoking. Um, and there's one of the things that that he mentions almost in passing, actually, that resonates hugely for me, which is this danger of becoming a performer rather than a player or, or narrating your own game while you're playing it, man, I do this all the time. And it's such a stupid thing to do, right? Because you're, you're sitting there, maybe you have a better or, or, or even winning position and you're already saying to yourself like, oh man, how am I going to annotate this game? Or how am I going to explain it to my friends in the Skittles room, you know, an hour from now, right? And then you of course completely lose track of your opponent's resources and you, don't win the game, right? Um, and so I really struggle not to narrate while I'm playing. I don't know. Does that ring a bell with you at all? Yeah, not not an affliction <laughs> that I suffer from. I have to say, you're lucky. You're yeah. lucky. I'm, I mean, I'm sure some of the, um, the I'm sure some of the things he describes in egoism, I am guilty of, but not not that particular issue. Um, yeah, and I guess my my issue with this chapter is I felt like the lines between this and the wanting chapter and sin in particular were were quite fuzzy to me, and that's sort of where what I was saying about like I feel like he needed seven sins, you know, like oh yeah, like, there's there's no doubt that some of these are kind of gerrymandered. Yeah, to make it exactly. Into the, well the number seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that's exactly what I was getting at. And you can't fault him, you know. You got to sell some books, and um, overall, it's still a brilliant work. But this is one where I'm like, are you? Am I sure this is a distinct sin from the others? And if it is, and again, I mean, he's like you say, he's so brilliant that sometimes things goes over your go goes over one's head. So that's also always possible. It's always possible just that I'm, that I'm missing something, but that. Oh yeah. There's definitely overlap. There's also contradiction sometimes yeah. between his sins, right? Like he says in the thinking chapter, um, you know, uh, 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 don't be uh, too analytical, you know, focus on the emotional content, you know, and then elsewhere he says, well, don't be too emotional. Don't get caught up in the narrative. Just think. So, you know, there are definitely ways in which these sins point in opposite directions or in some tension with one another. Yeah. Um, and, and that brings us to our sixth sin, which of course there also is a bit of overlap, but this one, um, this one really struck home with me as we'll discuss. This one is uh, perfectionism, which 
he describes among other common afflictions for those who suffer from perfectionism are uh, time trouble, what he calls jam lust, which means uh, asking too much of your position, um, moralizing, which is uh, where you you tell a story where you try to punish your opponent, and copycat crime, which is trying to to emulate another player, um, not necessarily like your opponent, just someone generally. Um, so are you guilty of any of those, David? Yeah, some of them. I mean, a, a lot of this chapter is about time trouble, um, which I know you've talked about on the podcast before. I actually, for whatever reason, like – I've never had a time pressure problem. I'm probably the opposite. I'm a little bit like a like a really, really bad version of Jan Nepomniachi. Like yeah. I play too fast, right? And so my problem actually is that when my opponent is in time trouble, I try too hard to play fast and exploit it. And then I end up, you know, losing. And they they checkmate me with one second left on their clock right. or whatever. Um, but, um, there's a lot of really practical tips here, uh, for avoiding time pressure and then also for dealing with it when you're in it. Um, so I actually thought, you know, if that were something that I was prone to, I would probably benefit a lot just from that discussion. W what do you think? You're, you're a time trouble addict, aren't you? Yeah, I am. And that's why this, this chapter really resonated with me and even rereading it all these years later, it, it struck me once again and. Yeah, like you say, 18 causes of time pressure. I mean, there's there's so much, um, there's there's so many useful tips. And I, I really was impressed with sort of the the overall insight that the the root cause um generally can be can be a lack of of confidence. Um that's something where that I'm guilty of stuff like double checking your variations um way too often. He he gives advice about that. Um, you know, he talks about this idea where some people kind of like to be like, they like to the spectacle of being in time trouble. So this is another one where it's like pretty related to, to just tournament chess, but I've, I, I don't do that consciously, but I also don't mind, um, <laughs> when, when I'm in time trouble. So there may be something subconscious at work there. There's lots of, uh, like you say, lots of useful tips that, that I found quite helpful, but time trouble for those of us who are affected by it. I mean, it's really like reading a book about quitting smoking or something. I mean, it's it's an incurable disease. Yeah, right? I mean, look no further than Grandmaster Alexander Grishuk. I mean, if 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 he can't if he can't conquer it, how am I going to? Right, and of course the you know the the thing about players like him is that if he were to quote unquote conquer it then he would no longer be the player that he is like some other aspect of what makes him great would probably go away. Like he, I'm not at all convinced that, that Grishuk would be, you know, a better player. I mean, whatever that means for someone who's been, you know, in the top five in the world, uh, if he got rid of time pressure, he might even be a worse player because that's just part of what makes him, him. Um, yeah. I mean, the, the one that the one uh, cause of time pressure that Rousen discusses that did resonate for me, um, was this idea of getting into time pressure to give yourself an excuse for losing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? And of course, it's not a good excuse at all. I mean, Alakine famously said that pleading time pressure as an excuse for losing is like pleading drunk as, drunkenness, uh, you know, as an excuse for a, a car accident or something, right? I mean, you know, it's it's not a good excuse. But, but nonetheless, sort of subconsciously, I think there are players, you know, who get into time pressure because it sort of takes the – game out of their hands in some weird sense, like that they no longer have full responsibility for it. Um, in my case, it's not so much time pressure, but it's things like sleeping poorly before the round. Like, you know, I don't sleep well before chess tournaments usually. And then I always go in and I'm like, oh, well, I was really tired and that's why I lost. Well, you know, I, that, that's no excuse either, but I, I sort of related to it indirectly in that way. Yeah. Yeah, and and the section this one didn't resonate as much with me, but but I still loved the the part about moralizing, where he's you know your opponent does something that you think is unsound, like when you play an opening that that you when they when you play an opening and they they play a move that you think violates its principles or maybe even that you just know it's bad but you can't remember why and you try to punish them and he shows a game that he played against uh, Super Grandmaster Morozevich, who at the time was like a top five, top 10 in the world. Um, and he, he he tries to punish him for what he perceives to be an inaccuracy and just, just gets thrashed. Um, definitely, I, f I felt like that was one of the stronger 
uh, sections, like game presentations in the book, even though I wasn't like nodding my head along as some as something that that I particularly do. Is that something that you do, David? Yeah, I, I could relate to that. I mean, you know, I think it's it, it like so many of these things. It's it's like moralizing is okay in moderation, right? Like there are softer versions of it where you say, oh gosh, you know, my opponent is a tempo down compared to the main line, right? Uh, how can I make use of that, right? Um, it's when it slips into true moral righteousness that it becomes a problem, like this person must be punished, right? Um, but I think people who are really knowledgeable about the openings are more prone, in my experience, to moralizing. I don't know. Have you ever watched the the YouTube Blitz videos of Christoph Selecki? I know he was a... Uh, uh, a guest on your podcast, Chess Explained. Yeah, I've seen a few. I mean, Christoph's a great guy. He's a fantastic teacher. I've even taken some lessons with him. He's so helpful. And he knows the openings incredibly well. Like his knowledge of of the openings is is easily strong grandmaster standard, right? Um, but if you watch his blitz games on YouTube, it's just kind of funny because this happens over and over, right? The opponent will misplay something in the opening and Christoph will be like, uh, sorry, no, you cannot play like that, right? And then in his zeal to punish the person, he might fall behind on the clock. And then as soon as the opponent finds some random tactic, Christoph is like, oh, come on, this is this is unfair. You know, <laughs> what a joke. You can't play like that. And, and then Christoph will lose, right? Because he was so focused on punishing the, the opening error. Um, you know, I love Christoph. I'm not trying to like, you know, uh, knock him in any way, but it's just kind of a, a funny thing that people who, who know their stuff so, so well are prone to sort of meeting out righteous punishment rather than just trying to play all the best moves. Yeah, I, I could totally see that. And shout out to Christoph if you're listening. He, he does listen sometime. And yeah, his, I mean, his opening knowledge is incredible. So I can, I can, he's awesome. I can he's see, awesome. see how that would be an issue. And also even the one said, so this one I felt like was just like jam packed with, with this chapter with useful information, even this idea of jam lust. I'm not a big fan of the, the name jam, jam lust for it. Well, it's like, he says, you know, you have butter on your bread and suddenly you want jam too. That's where the, the name comes from. Yeah. So he says it's asking too much of your position. And this one, I think I see it a lot in club players. I mean, they, you know, it's, um, they just try to attack in every position or, you know, they might not, not have like the full array of sort of positional ideas fleshed out. So they'll try to do like sort of whatever, like the minority attack in positions where it's not called for or, or whatever it might, may be. But the idea of just, uh, trying to do things that are, are not merited based on, on the qualities of your position is definitely, um, pretty common sin. Um, yeah, absolutely. The, the one thing that didn't really work for me in this chapter was what he calls copycat yeah. crime, where, where you're sort of modeling your play after some, you know, top grandmaster. Yeah, his with Mickey Adams. I, yeah. It's funny because mine, even before I read this book, I would sometimes think, what would Mickey Adams huh. do? Because his style is so different from mine. Um, and I, I would use that as a way of trying to sort of tame my my you know tactical instincts and try to play more positionally and boy i think there's so much more good than bad about trying to emulate really good players um i i it's hard for me to imagine that club players get into trouble yeah that way um uh, i think they benefit from it more often than they than they don't yeah yeah to me that was like a distinctly kind of i am to gm type affliction at least at right. least as he described because sort of you know, I'd, I'd settle for playing like any grandmaster, you know, or, <laughs> absolutely. Whereas, whereas with him, it's like, he's, he's playing like Adams in a position where he should play like tall, but like, yeah, I'll sign up for, for either one. So, um, yeah. And that, that section was a bit drawn out. So that, that wasn't my favorite part either, but again, so much, um, awesome stuff. And again, it's like eight bucks on Kindle, this book. So especially anyone with time trouble issues, um, it, uh, of course, as we said, it's way easier to to read the advice than to implement it, but it's still uh, the as good advice as you'll find about how to uh, try to remedy that particular sin. Um, and that brings us to our seventh sin, which is uh, looseness, which he describes as losing the plot, drifting, which would be playing without a plan, what he calls neural hijackings, which we'll get to, and what he calls tension transference. Um, so yeah, this one's uh, getting more abstruse as he winds up. What did what did you think of it, David? 
Yeah, this is sort of the catch-all sin, yeah. you know, that sort of like his, his publisher said, you can't have nine deadly sins, mm-hmm. so why don't you pack <laughs> a bunch into the last one? Um, but but I think we all, we've all recognized this in our play when we're just too loose. I, I particularly liked the idea of tension transference. So this is the idea that like when there's tension in the chess position, it can get transferred into the player. Right, like the more unresolved tension there is on the board, like pawns that could be captured or whatever, the more nervous tension the players are going to feel, and it's incredibly common, I think, for for club players like myself to want to resolve that tension uh, that they're feeling in their minds by by prematurely resolving the tension on the board, and that often results in unfavorable trades, liquidation into a worse ending. I even think this happens at the highest level. I mean, I really believe that um, if you look at the 2013 World Championship match between Anand and Carlson, the tension uh, of playing on his home turf in Chennai caused Anand to try to seek simplification on the board uh, 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 too often. I mean, I, I, far be it for me to try to, you know, psychoanalyze like one of the greatest players of all time. But there were so many key moments in that match where Anand probably should have kept the tension on the board in retrospect, but, but he instead traded into like a slightly worse ending. And I just felt like he was feeling the nerves and it was translating into the way that he was playing. And so there's a lot, I think, to learn from there as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's definitely, definitely an affliction in chess and poker and poker tournaments. They call it blowing up where you just like sit there playing sane and then just some hand, you just like bluff off all your chips, like without thought, basically, um, not, not in a planned manner. Um, and, and he also gives the example of uh, neural hijackings and uh, with no less an authority than a, a Kasparov game um, uh, dissected there where Kasparov just kind of, um, basically has a moment of what you would call temporary insanity. I mean, he just sort of quotes Kasparov saying, basically, uh, I just I just wasn't thinking at this point. Um, right. That was his loss to Sokolov after winning seven straight, mind you, at, at Vikonze in 99. Yeah. So even when you're riding high, um, you can still have these uh, these these psychological issues. But yeah, I mean, these um definitely something to be aware from aware of. I think they're they're, they might be slightly more apropos for, for higher level chess, although losing the plot, um, certainly certainly that's one that any player of any level can relate to where you... You've... Sometimes I don't get the plot in the first place. Right, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's an excellent point. Um, so yeah, I mean, that chapter generally is just kind of about the inter- eternal, internal emotional struggle of, of chess. Um, so that wraps up the seven sins. Um, we we both highlighted a few favorite quotes. Should we jump into a couple of those, David? Yeah, sure. I mean, there's so many great quotes in this book, um, but um, there's one that I really like. Uh, it's on page 178 of the print edition, uh, where he says, "Self belief is not about thinking you will never go wrong, um, but rather knowing that you can and will go wrong, but that these mistakes don't define you." Uh, and I think that's really good advice for life as well as chess. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and there's, yeah, there's lots of life wisdom, obviously, uh, sprinkled throughout Grandmaster Rousen's writing, not just in this book, but uh, I, I haven't read the Grunfeld book because I was never a Grunfeld player, but uh, definitely in his, in his other books, it's uh, everywhere you look. Um, one of my favorites, getting back to the materialism chapter, is uh, he uses an analogy when he's talking about thinking about chess pieces and point values of comparing it to lasagna and gangsters, which is just like so, <laughs> so off the wall. So the, the quote is, uh, lasagna is the source of nourishment and films for entertainment. You need lasagna to stay alive, but, but there would be nothing to live for without gangster movies. So it's not so much that you couldn't imagine life without either because the gangster is not threatening to take anything away, but you just can't think of how to compare them on feeling a little extra pressure on your temple. You wake up in a cold sweat and he just goes on and on about like if you had to measure your love of gangster movies and in quantities of lasagna um he, he he equates that to to thinking of chess pieces in in point values which i mean it's it's an off the wall metaphor it really resonates just because it's it's uh so well i don't know if resonates is the right word it really it, um 
It's very memorable, um, I should say, but it didn't exactly resonate to me because I think, um, uh, as has often come up on the podcast, there's there's a human desire to to have pieces fit in neat point buckets. So he's describing it as like this inherent tension. When I think for for lower rated players, it's the lack of tension that's the issue. It's the just thinking of the pieces as like a static value, um, but the the incongruity that he's trying to demonstrate is uh is is a point well made yeah i i when i read that passage i just thought mm, lasagna. yeah exactly um let's see what else um so yeah he's got a thing where he's talking about the principle of two weaknesses and he describes it as you you try to which for those who don't know is like this sort of well-worn idea discussed discussed in uh Grandmaster Cheryshevsky's Endgame Strategy, among many other books, uh, and he describes it as a uh, as you try to tickle their ref- left rib and they cover, still with a hand to spare. So you go for the right rib and they cover that too. But then they are so rel- rigidly defensive that you could do whatever you want, which is just a nice little analogy for the idea of needing a second weakness in order to make progress in in an endgame. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. Um, there's a there's another quote on page 177 where he just says, after a major exchange of pieces or change in the pawn structure, it's generally a good idea to take a fresh look at the position. Uh, it takes your thoughts and emotions a while to catch up with the positional changes. And I think that's so true. You know, just take a little time, settle into the new normal. Uh, when the position changes in that way. Yeah, and he he gives little tips, like he quotes his friend Grandmaster Tiger Halar Pearson talking about like stepping outside and going for like a 10-foot sprint in the middle of a game in order to sort of reorient yourself. And And that was another thing I liked about this book, especially reading it so many years later, is you could really sense that the, the European chess community in particular was uh, pretty tight knit and that, that he collaborated with a lot of people. I mean, he's quoting Tiger Hill person. He's quoting like, uh, then, uh, I am Jan Gustafsson. Um, a lot of the, the British players, Grandmaster Jonathan Levitt, who he also quotes in the book, uh, Luke McShane, who, who knows he must've been pretty young at that point, but a lot of collaboration and a lot of sort of tips shared just from, from his interactions with, uh, his fellow, um, strong young players who have gone on to become um, even even higher profile in the game. Um, so, David, we got one listener question from friend and most recent uh, fellow book recapper, um, Jonathan, who, of course, helped with uh, Simple Chess last month. Um, and he asks, he says, Jonathan Rousen later described Seven Deadly Sins as a good first draft. Would you agree or is he being too modest? Yeah, I actually would agree in a way. I mean, there's a quality of that in this book. Um, but I actually think it's kind of the way Rousen thinks or the way he writes. He he sort of thinks out loud and he uh, he's so curious and he's so interested in so many things. He doesn't always chase them down fully, right? Um, uh, there's also a quality of what uh, philosophers call epistemic humility in the writing, which is to say Rousen kind of knows what he doesn't know. And so he doesn't pretend to know more than he does. So he'll say things like, I realize this isn't so clear, or maybe this is a blind alley. There's even a point where he says, please don't quote me on this, even though I'm writing it in my own book. Right. Um, uh, And then there's stuff about lasagna and gangsters. Like it doesn't quite fully make sense. um, But he's just so interested in these ideas um, that he just goes with them as far as he can. And he sometimes doesn't tie up all the loose ends. So yeah, it can feel a little bit like a first draft at times. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the book, it could be a little shorter, I would say. I mean, um, you know, I'm 90% positive on the book, but but there are a couple parts that could have used some tightening up. And, uh, and let's just remember, I mean, he was 23 when he wrote this. It's just an absolutely staggering work of, of depth for a 23-year-old to write. So, so to say that it, that it could have been tightened up is a pretty mild criticism. And one that I noticed that like in John Watson's review, um, you know, that came out at the time the book was published, um, 
John also found as gentle a way a possible as possible to say sort of the same thing. I mean, um, even the positive reviews would say like the 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 good overwhelmingly outweighs the bad, but but this could have been a little bit shorter. So, and it's always you know for for someone like Grandmaster Rousen, who's such a, a great writer and public intellect, um, it you know you're you're always your own worst critic. So I, I'm I'm not sure where he said that, but I'm sure it's uh, I'm sure it comes from the heart. I would love to write a first draft as good as this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'll, I'll, any draft um, I would settle for. Um, so in wrapping up, I mean, there's so much more we could say about the book, but I think we'll we'll roughly leave it there. Um, and uh, listeners, if you've already read it and decide to revisit it, that's great. Um, a lot of people have been listening to these book recap podcasts more than back in the day. So I appreciate that these are starting to catch on. And uh, thanks to everyone for indulging us talking for to, about our favorite chess books for, for so long, um, you know, <laughs> for an hour and a half or whatever it may be. Um, but before we let you listeners escape, um, we wanted to... C- touch on a couple more things. So number one is David actually met Jonathan Rousen um, in, in person a little bit. So what were your your personal reaction uh, interactions with him like, David? Yeah, I think we met around 2003 uh, when I was living in New York City and Rousen was in the States. I think he was studying at Harvard at the time. Um, and I have this recollection of first meeting him at the chess tables in Washington Square Park, um, which I'm sure you've been to, Ben. Yes. Uh, I mean, I when I lived there, man, I spent hundreds, maybe thousands of hours playing Blitz for a few bucks a game there. And that chess park is like right across the street from the NYU law school. I think maybe Rousen was at some NYU event, but being a chess player, he naturally you know, made his way across the street to the chess tables. And uh, I was there. He somehow found out that I was a lawyer. Maybe I told him that. Uh, and this was right around the time of the beginning of the Iraq war. And I remember Rousen saying to me in his very soft spoken sort of Scottish accent. So, you know, you're a lawyer. Uh, uh, does the invasion of Iraq violate international law? <laughs> you know, can Cheney and Rumsfeld be extradited as war criminals? You know, I'm doing a terrible Scottish <laughs> accent there. And I just remember having to mumble something like, ah, oh, well, you know, international law, that's not my area of expertise, but that's like, that's Rousen. He's always asking the big questions, you know, even with people he's just met. Um, so anyway, yeah, I remember I, um, I was already a fan of this book actually. So I, I, I ultimately contacted him and actually ended up taking a handful of lessons from him on ICC, on the Internet Chess Club, probably around 2004. Uh, I'm not sure he would remember me. I mean, he seemed to have lots of students. But yeah, I definitely enjoyed our lessons. And they were a lot like this book. Like He was very focused on the emotional side of the game, the psychological side of the game. I mean, I remember one example, which is pretty specific for an audio only podcast. So hopefully your listeners can follow along. But at the time I was playing uh, a variation of the Rosalimo Sicilian with black, uh, in which white has a bit of a hole on D4, sort of a Maroxy bind type structure. And black has this knight on, on F6 that he'd love to get to that outpost on D4. But obviously that takes a long time, right? You have to go something like knight from F6 to E8, to C7, to E6, and then to D4, right? Um, and, you know, maybe it's worth it to spend that that many tempi to do that. Maybe it's not. But I was just doing it reflexively. And, and, and Rousen and I were going over this position. And he just said, like, why is it so important to you to follow this plan? Like, why aren't you thinking for yourself? Why aren't you taking responsibility for right. your own choices? You know, this kind of thing. Um, and that was like, really revelatory for me. You know, it wasn't about specific chess skills. It was much more about my approach to the game. So I really appreciated uh, the the little time that I got to spend, uh, you know, virtually online with him as well. Excellent. Yeah. And that definitely sounds like it could be straight out of the seven deadly chess sins. So totally funny story. Um, And David, did I see on your bio somewhere that you argued before the Supreme Court or prepared something before the Supreme? Yeah, no, I've argued a couple of cases in the U.S. Supreme Court, and I used to be a law clerk there as well. So, David, how does arguing before the Supreme Court compare in the tension you feel to playing a tournament chess game? 
You know, I get way more nervous playing a tournament chess game than arguing uh, in the Supreme Court. It's 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 weird, but yeah, it's uh, the the one case that I that the the sort of uh, big case that I argued in the Supreme Court. Uh, it was probably helpful in a way that we knew we were going to lose, <laughs> so it was sort of liberating. Um, but I wasn't particularly nervous for that. And whereas chess games, man, I lose sleep the night before. I don't know what it is. Huh? That's crazy. How? how one can get acclimated to anything, or maybe it shows, um, you know, um, more confidence in the, in the realm of law as opposed well, to, to be fair. I mean, I did prepare solid for, you know, two weeks straight for the Supreme court argument. Whereas for chess games, I usually spend about 10 minutes looking at lines. So maybe that's, that's, positive. yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I mean, I, yeah, I can totally understand it's, um, chess is nerve wracking. Um, cool. Well, David, this has been awesome. I we do want to tie up a few loose ends before we let you out of here. Um, Number one, I'm going to make a small donation uh, as a s- compensation for your efforts. And uh, to what entity did you suggest I donate? Yeah, the Chicago Chess Center, which does a, a bunch of cool stuff here in Chicago in terms of uh, reaching out to underserved communities and getting them into chess. So thanks so much, Ben. That's really generous of you. Awesome. Happy to do that. And thank you so much. I know you're you're a busy guy like the rest of us, so I really appreciate all your preparation and um Glad we could make this happen. Um, for this was for a blast. Little- Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, it was, and um, yeah, maybe we can do another one someday because um, a lot of fun, and there's so many books to discuss. Um, which last thing before uh, we call it a podcast, I did want to let listeners know I'm not going to do any blindfold puzzles this month. Um, maybe next month if you're missing them, email me. Otherwise, I'll assume that you're not, um, or tweet me or mention it in the Facebook group or whatever. Um, and. Uh, for next month, we are tentatively scheduled. I am tentatively scheduled to discuss actually a book that's only recently released, which is Attacking the Strong Point by Igor Zaitsev. And we are going to bring back friend of the show and cognitive scientist Christopher Shabri to talk about it um, approximately one month from when you hear this. So um, anything else before we let you out of here, David? No, thanks, Ben. This has been really, really fun. I really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Likewise, really appreciate all of your efforts. And uh, you're on Facebook, right? You can find me on Facebook, on Twitter. Um, Yep. Okay. On on various uh, chess playing websites, playing way too much Blitz. Excellent. So yeah, people can track you down and take you on. Um, All right. Sounds good. And uh, thanks for listening, everyone. And we will catch you all next time. Thanks, as always, to my producer, Matthew Passy, and to everyone who helps spread the word about the show, telling your friends, writing positive reviews on podcast platforms. All of that stuff helps. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Beneficial1. Join the Perpetual Chess Facebook group. You can find the link on the website. And we are back in action on Instagram, at Perpetual Chess, sharing a weekly clip from the podcast. So follow us over there as well. But of course, the main purpose of these credits is to thank everyone who makes the show possible by their financial support. Without you all, Perpetual Chess would have ceased to exist a long time ago. And for that, I am forever grateful and work to continually improve and expand the offerings from Perpetual Chess. So without further ado, I would like to give extra special thanks to the following people and entities. Chessable.com, David Lazarus of LazmanChess.com, Quality Chess Books, The Capital City Chess Club, The Abysmal Deaths of Chess Blog, Adapta Interactive Web Designs and Services, The Apprentice Twitch Channel, Andrew Alharji, Andrew Bach, Anidi Deer, Austin Clough, Benjamin Porto, Bill Sigler, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, The Charlotte Chess Center, The Chess Central's Chess Blog, ChessMood.com, Chris Flanagan, Chris Lott, Dan O'Hanlon, Daniel He, Danny Davidson, David Schreiber, Derek Jones, I am Dimitri Schneider, I am Eric Rosen, Eric Tam, Ewan Richardson, Farhan Thawar, Faraz Sawaf, Gary Foreman, Glenn Downing, Greg Harfs, Greg Shahadi, Gregory Gulick, Guven Manet. James Kennedy, Jeff Martinson, Jens Green, Jeremy Nielsen, John Jernigan, John Rockefeller, John Cromarty, John Mar- MacArthur, Kelly Palmer, Kevin O'Callaghan, King Selt, Lucio Casada Silva, The Law Offices of Stuart Katz, Matthew Feeney, Michael Can, FM Michael Oblin, Mike Zelazny, Mr. Mike Shahadi, The Famous Mr. Dodgy, The Nerd Nays Twitch Channel, Peter Sodi, The Playmore Chess Academy of the Hampton Chess Club, 
Reuven Fisher, the Seattle Chess Club, Shane Unger, Stephen Kelty, Stephen Martinez, Thomas Stanix, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryan of StrongChess.com, Todd Kennedy, the Vintage Patsers, which is a Chess.com improver group, Wayne Beam, William Hogarth, Aaron Waffler, Ace Viega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, FM Andre Terakov, Dr. Andrew Perry, Barry Hessian, Bill Juniper, Bill Moran, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brett Howard Lynn, Brian Mullis, Bruce Scott, Brian Tillis of Palm Beach Chess, Chad Hilton, Dr. Charles Snodgrass, Chris Wayne Scott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalecki, a.k.a. Chess Explain, Coach J's Chess Academy, Corey Budson, Costa Chorus, Courtney Fry, Craig Mallon, Daniel Ginsberg, Daniel Naylor, Dave Saylor, David Bleskacek, David Brown, David Hamblin, David Cramley, Dalen Shelton, Dennis Parrish, Dirk Decker, FM Donnie Ariel, Douglas Matthew, Dwayne Edmonds, Ed Daly, Emmanuel Langua Robitai, Ethan Smith, Hallelujah Cat, Ian Mason, Indrick Ryland, Felipe Melo Pereira, Fox Valley Chess Club, Francis Latart Lavoie, Dr. Frank Tortoris, Frank Zananis, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geert Vandervelt, Gene Stewart, Gerard Barta, Giovanni Russo, Han Schut, Harish Renivasan, Howard Vihan, Jacob Kovacs, Jacob Turan, Jacques Perry, James Espinwall, James Banastia, James Muir, Jason Willem, J.D. Chakrabarty, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, Yep Hoyland, Jerry Wells, Jim Ratliff, John Tully, Juan Almaguer, Dr. John Fallon, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, John Jeffrey, John McMurty, Jonathan Slater, John Tully, Jose Rodriguez, Justin Gardner, WGM Jen Shahadi, Joel Rocky, John Thompson, Grandmaster Josh Friedel, I am Kare Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, Kevin Boyce, Kevin Pryor, Kior Gada of the Lakeshore Chess Club, I am Kostya Kavutsky, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Kyle McAvoy, Larry Ryforth, Laura Boyovsky, Macaulay Peterson, Mark Miller, Martin Knudsen, Martin Krug, Matthew Passy, Matthew Tedesco, Matthias Plock, the Mechanics Institute Chess Club of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Michael Hudson, Miguel Araspidi, Mike Clem, Mitchell Fabian, Nate Salon, Neil Bruce, Nigmat Malajanov, Nicholas Isabel, Olaf Mueller Michaels, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passy Passanen, Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Randy Tempo, Ricky Grijalva, Richard Hallenbuck, Robert Tichi, Robert Turner, Rory Coleman, Rory Yearwood, Ryan Berg, the Say Chess YouTube channel, Scott Doherty, Scott McKinnon, Sebastian Finsterwater, Walder, Shane Unger, the Sil- Silver Knights in Richmond, Stefan Roller, WGM Tatia of Abrahamian, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Tom Edsel, Tomas Komanich, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Vishnu Srikumar, William H. Brock, William Juniper, William Peterson, FM Zhao Cheng of of chess1000.com and of course Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks for listening everyone. We will be back next week with another episode of Perpetual Chess.